Hi, I'm Josh, an American living in Europe. If you don't know that, like you have no business moving yet. I sat down with a top financial planner to ask my and your questions about the do's and don'ts of money and moving abroad. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you see people make before they move in terms of financial mistakes? Here's what's in store. That's a great way to start the discussion. You really should not. And there's a number of reasons for that. Don't go thinking you have to take all your money into your house right away. Okay. So it's not about that as much as it is the US being the best place to invest money still. I've had people do plans and they haven't thought these things through. And then halfway through, they're like, oh God. So you earn more, you keep more of your earnings. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. You get to keep it all. Yeah. And all is a lot more than everything <laughs> less. <laughs> understand the difference so that you can understand the interplay between them. It can go from 100 to, to 2,000 because you Ooh. might have different situations. Better sell that before you become a tax resident here. And that's the thing. Like, we got to know what the grid is and like yes. know where you're playing in the grid. I'm not sure how you you reconcile that. Like you must really love right. to live here. So I'm here with John McNurtney and we are gonna discuss the biggest mistake that we need you to avoid before you move to Portugal. John, thanks for meeting with me. You got it. So you have consulted with plenty of clients specifically moving to Portugal, but the advice that you can give is, is kind of a broad, a bit of advice about moving abroad. Uh, there are technical things that people can do and maybe should avoid doing before they leave the U.S. and move to a foreign country. What are some things and patterns that you've noticed people do or don't do that can really get them into some financial trouble? That's a great way to start the discussion. Um, you know, there are, there are a few basic things that you need to always get right. Number one is you need to be really clear about what it is that you are doing. It's, it's surprising to me how many people start the planning process with an advisor and they don't know where they're going. And this was before I, I joined uh, the expat world, yeah. but even more so now because yes. some people actually just, and, and I love where their heart is at, but they fire and forget that like they need to have a plan for, for how much money they're going to have in another country for maybe three or four decades in some cases. Yeah. And they just really haven't put a target on that. Okay. So you got to be realistic. And some people just are not. God bless them, but like they want to retire and they want to move abroad. And for a lot of people, those are the same thing. Mm. So you have to know, like, what are you going to be spending? What are your reserves? Okay. Number two. Number two is understand the currency risk piece. Like people don't okay. know that like you got to bring money into euros. Like that will sort of shrink the perceived value of your money. And then, you know, it's going to cost less to live here. And so that'll increase the price just a little. But like, don't go thinking you have to take all your money into euros right away. Okay. A bunch of people come to me. They're like, so should, should I move all the money? Like, and I should, right? Now. Well, not really. You really should not. And there's a number of reasons for that. Do you look at a tactic like, um, like in the stock market where you can kind of dollar cost average? Do you look at that as being something that people should do just over time? Like be transferring a certain amount every month or every quarter, regardless of what the exchange rate is? So it's not about that as much as it is the U.S. being the best place to invest money still. As of 2023. Glad you said that. I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I actually, the first thing I did when I got bias. here is I looked at the market and I tried to eradicate my confirmation bias. Right. Like, what's this market, the European market, really look like? Yeah. And like I evaluated in like a very black and white way how yeah. large it is, how deep it is, how diverse is it? Yeah. And it's, it's not, not as good. Yeah. Like, and... And there were Portuguese people, by the way, that were professionals I was networking with yeah. that were like, why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> we don't make money. Like, you guys are good at making money. Yeah. And so don't take all your money here. Okay. Like, that could be a mistake. Just like buying a house with all your money right away if you can mortgage. Okay. Good. Interesting. Three. Three is, uh, well, I mean, everybody knows what they know. Uh, so if, if you're a, like a passive investor and you're just all real estate, like maybe your money's all tied up in real estate. Okay. Or if you uh, really love crypto, I mean, a few people have actually come to me and they've got too much money over there. And so lack in of- crypto? Yeah. Okay. Because you can actually invest in crypto far more powerfully here because there's no taxes. 
Right. Yeah. The capital so you gains. Earn more, yeah. So you earn more. You keep more of your earnings. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah you get to keep it all. Yeah. And all is a lot more than everything less. <laughs> <laughs> so you get to keep your money. So, but yeah, not being properly diversified is just as much a problem here um, as, as it will always be um, okay. anywhere. Number four? Number four is understand the taxes, right? Okay. So we've just come off of this, this, this NHR debacle mm. where um, it looks like it may be ending. You may not be able to uh, qualify for the non-habitual residency regime. And so you, you just have to know then what you'll, you'll be taxed on for your various kinds of income mm. and the various kinds of capital gains and things that are being produced by your investments. If you don't know that, like you have no business moving yet. And taxes can be quite specific. Actually, they are very specific and personal to the individual, to the right. individual earner. Um, not all sources of income are taxed the same way. Right. What, what's your advice on people approaching their, their tax planning pre-move and then after they move? So you, you basically need to do it just like, uh, like think about writing a book report and then translating it. You got to read the book and understand the book first in English. Mm -hmm. Make sure you understand it from cover to cover. Like, don't think that you understand it. Understand it. Okay. And then you have to do the translation. And the translation, if you're going to do a good one, has also have, it has to have its own internal logic. Your Portuguese taxes might follow some different rules mm. than your, your American taxes. So understand the difference so that you can understand the interplay between them. Yeah. So if you're getting passive income in the United States, will you be able to uh, report that income and be taxed in roughly the same way when you're here. Right. And, 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 and is that going to uh, apply across the board with all of your passive investments? Like the deductions, the depreciation, all the stuff that you might be taking for granted. Like it's like gravity Mix my metaphors on, on one planet. <laughs> it's another planet. So yeah. like, just make sure every piece of your particular situation is going to translate effectively because it might not at all. Have you started to do your taxes, your Portuguese taxes yourself, or have you hired that piece out to someone else? Uh, I did it myself last year. Okay. But I, I also, well, not really. I mean, I did the version one and then I handed it off to a contabilista. Okay. And I had them do the final sign off because okay. I just, I want to have somebody sign off. Just not comfortable with that piece yet. Plus they assume liability. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And your American taxes, do you do those yourself? Yes. Do you do those for clients as well? You, no, I, I'm okay. not a certified uh, tax planner. Okay. They think about things like from a very particular point of view. And financial planners are not the same as, as tax, uh, as accountants. So do you recommend someone finds a, a professional that can do it on the U.S. side and someone that can do it on the Portuguese side? Or do you try to find in Portugal someone that knows both? There are people that know how to do both. Okay. If you can find one of these guys uh, or gals, that yeah. is like a unicorn. So okay, let me, okay, so let me ask you this, because I think we both know some people that do it. What is the, what is an average amount to pay someone who uh, knows both tax codes? Who knows both tax codes? Yeah, and can I mean, file your taxes. It can go from a hundred to to two thousand, because you Ooh. might have different situations. Okay, okay, got you. Like there, it can be simple and it'd be a hundred. It could be complex and it'd be yeah. A I mean, you and I both know people that have like businesses and and you know properties and like maybe they've got a commercial property that they're a part owner of and like in both countries. So it could be a lot of money and it could be totally worth it. Mm. But like your average tax filer can probably get in for something like 500. Okay. Yeah. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you see people make before they move to Portugal in terms of financial mistakes? So I've had some people like sell their properties where they didn't have to. Okay. You know, and they, they just weren't like 100% that they were going to stay here. So that's not like a clear financial mistake, but it definitely paints them into a corner in case they want to move back to the States. Some people sell assets uh, out of their portfolio where um, they really don't have to. Uh, some people don't sell assets and they really ought to. If you're not qualifying for NHR, you're going to be immediately liable for all the capital gains Everything. in your portfolio. Yeah. So I had a person who had a, a million dollar position in a stock, had a cost basis. Uh, they, you know, they bought it for 300 grand. Mm -hmm. So that's $700,000 in gain. Right. Better sell that before you become a tax resident here if you don't have the cover, actually, even if you have NHR, 
you're going to be assessed at, at almost 30% on all of that position. Okay. Even if it's in an IRA. Okay. Whoa. So that, that was a, like a kind of a lightning bolt for this person. I thought NHR was capped at 20. 28% on capital gains. On capital gains. Oh, that's right. On capital gains. Capital gains. Got it. Yes. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. And that's the thing. Like we got to know what the grid is and like yes. know where you're playing in the grid and just make sure that it all nets out. Okay. Because it gets confusing. Yeah. There are a decent amount of people watching this video that know about NHR and hopefully they got in NHR uh, before the deadline. Yeah. So let's talk about, let's talk about that. Uh, what are some things that people who have NHR should consider before NHR for them ends, before their 10-year period ends? Are there things that they can do to optimize before things yes, end? Yes, there's things. Uh, there's lots of things. Um, I think that the one that I always am, am amazed by is real estate. <laughs> Sell your real estate if, if you have it in the States before it ends because that is like a real cutoff. Like if you don't have NHR, you have to pay at that 28% rate on all of your capital gains for, for real estate in the U.S., even though you know, we're here in Portugal. Yeah. So that's a biggie. Um, and then if you're doing things like Roth conversions, if you're moving money from your IRA into your Roth IRA and you're paying taxes in the U.S., you, you want to make sure that you conclude those activities uh, effectively mm -hmm. um, before the end of the 10-year period. There's, there's some other more kind of technical ones, but uh, those are the big ones, I think, that ordinary people need to know about. What about in terms of rental income? Because there are quite a few people that are moving abroad with the D7 visa, passive income, yeah. uh, that, that have rental income. Is there a way to be more efficient, maybe putting it into an LLC or putting it into some sort of real estate trust? I don't think there is. <laughs> I've actually given some real... A consideration to this, like even if you were to move all of your properties uh, into a different instrument, like okay. there are some things like Delaware Citus trusts that you can like get a 1031 exchange and move into and, but it all is going to look like passive income, which, you know, if you're effectively a Portuguese tax resident, mm. you're liable to. And in fact, it's better if you keep it in the properties because the Portuguese tax code will allow you to take all of the forms of uh, deductions against the passive income that you currently receive. The net is what's going to be taxable to you here. So you're better off just keeping it in its, in its current form. Um, if it's traditional real estate that you can continue to, you know, deduct against for various reasons. Have you explored other countries in Europe that would be more tax efficient for people? Um, and what are some of the recommendations that you have there? I have skimmed this book. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I've skimmed it. I, my understanding is that France is better for retirement accounts. Um, I understand that Italy is better for ultra high net worth individuals, you know, but I, I am, I am a diehard Portuguese guy yeah. uh, right now. Um, yeah. so I'm not, I'm not an expert on these areas. Um, I was in Ireland, uh, about a week ago and mm. I studied their tax code. Sorry guys, it's not better. It's harder. <laughs> is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It is straight up like so much harder. Uh, and I went, okay, well, I guess cross that one off the list for me. Okay. I did want to ask you this. You, you're a massive fan of Portugal, but uh, in your professional opinion, in terms of personal finance for people, are there certain types of people that shouldn't move to Portugal based on their income or based on their income levels? Like if, if they just, they don't want to be crushed by the weight of taxes. Oh, it hurts me to say this, Josh, but yes. Yeah. I just did a financial plan for somebody that was the poster child for this, and the NHR caught them in its, in its bullseye. And this guy has like $300,000 in passive income. Whoa. Whoa, good for him. Yes. Yeah? But, you know, here's the thing. Like, he's going to get taxed like double on that passive income if he moves here. Okay. So I'm not sure how you, you reconcile that. Like, you must really love right. to live here <laughs> if right. you're willing to pay the difference. That's just what it is. Okay. Um, and, and the same goes for, uh, you know, owning your real estate and then needing to sell it. If it becomes accessible to you here, that's very hard. There's also people that are um, working for companies that, um, you know, they need to keep their, their W-2 income coming from a company. If they haven't had that, that conversation with the, with the firm that they're working for, mm -hmm. they better have that conversation first because that, that company may or may not want to keep them on. Once right. they move here. Right. 
um, because that company is going to have to effectively become a Portuguese tax resident uh, to continue to to properly work with that person. Okay. So they should leave and become a 1099 contractor um, and then uh, work as a contractor if, yeah. if they can for that same company. Got so it. I've had people do plans and they haven't thought these things through. And then halfway through, they're like, oh God, I guess I didn't realize that this is all going to come crashing down around me. Right. When should people reach out to you? Like at what point in their move preparations should they reach out to you to, to get a real concrete plan? Yeah. How far out? Ah, uh, you know, Josh, what's interesting is I used to say as early as possible. Sure. It's not as early as possible Agreed. as it turns out. Actually, yeah. you should do it like when you're getting onto that runway, like mm. not while the plane is in the hangar. Like, right. so it should be like a year out, just a year. Okay. Maybe less than a year just to kind of like really run through kind of like, it's like a dry rehearsal for, for what's about to happen. Right. And you don't need to dry her rehearse for something that's too far away. Sure. So once it's about to happen, I'm, I'm there to help you do your final check. Okay. And make sure all the diagnostic panels are lit, are lit up green. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Good analogy. Yeah. So how do people contact you? Like anybody, like I'm online. Okay. <laughs> so you can visit me at my website, uh, which is just the name of my company, Green Ocean Global net and they can email me and uh i try to be uh, accessible okay it's not hard to find me do you charge an hourly rate for like the planning mm -hmm. booking okay so our business is is basically i have two different types of clients so i have people that retain me which is i think super valuable because then i care deeply about keeping you happy sure <laughs> i just keep working for you and helping navigate as you go forward but that costs more than just doing a one-time plan. So yeah. I have also created a one-time plan so that you can just, you know, get a blueprint today. And if that's uh, exciting to you and you want to hire me so that I'm like a full-time financial planner for you, then, then I can do it. But okay. Optionality. Nice. If you want to know more about John and how he transitioned to Portugal with his family, check out this video right here. If you want to know more about John and his business, go to greenoceanglobal.net or check out the description section below. Thanks for watching. Now, let's get moving. Bye.